Okay, yeah, let's let's start this. I don't see it being on air for some reason. I don't know why, but I'm just re gonna record this right now, so that others can take a look at it. Any case, so let's see if anyone joins. But for you, for now, we got both of you guys. So so we're hearing that you guys are as far as May 14 goes. You're looking at going. Uh, Joshua, you're gonna go be out there in Seattle so you can help Israel. Is that would that be the case? What sound like? In other words, what would that mean for Joshua if you want, wanted to do your workshop? Where would? What are your thoughts then? Um, Hi, Stacy. Um, what was the question, Martin? Yeah, I'm asking if so. If you're looking at going over to to Seattle, the May on a May date, uh, are you looking at yeah. doing another workshop some other time, like like a like a month away yeah, from that, or similar time? Or? Yeah, I'll be trying to do mine in June. Okay. All right. That sounds good, Stacy. Hi. How are you? Can you hear us? Yeah, I can. Okay, good. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's um, your sound is a little, a little uh, off, but. Okay. Um. Yeah. Well, let's let's listen in for a little bit. Let's see if anyone else shows up. But we've got the recording anyway, so let's go forward. So, right now, I, I guess I would be looking for Jonathan and others. But okay, we'll catch up with them later. Jenna said that she would be able to make it a little later on. So, so the goal for today is just to follow up and and first of all ask: Did anyone <laughs> play with their printer? Did anyone actually get it running and print print some things? Just I'm curious. Yeah, I got I got mine going uh, here at home, um, uh, but then I uh, the uh, program I use I was I was trying to use my tablet and uh, the program on the tablet crashed and it messed up the print like several times. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then I ran out of, of uh, filament, so okay. I need to get some filament. <laughs> okay. All right. How about Stacy Joshua? Any um, any luck on yours? Okay, and how about Stacy? Any? I have not, I have not played with mine yet. Okay, okay. Well, so let's. Yeah. All right. Well, let's let's uh, dive into the next step. So so for today, we just want to talk about the next step, which is the bed leveling, the automatic bed leveling. So I'm gonna send you to this doc. So so maybe what I would propose is that let's go over the whole process today, and then we can do another follow up next week to see if I basically follow the procedure and see if anyone has any trouble uh, so that next week we can actually have this running and see if anyone had any issues so we can basically troubleshoot that so that would be let's see who who's joined us who else we have me. I tried to get on the link there and it didn't, uh, didn't work so oh, okay Okay, how come it says Hermit and um, that's that's you there? No, who is that? Is that okay? There's some weird. It's showing her. It's showing Hermit on, on the. Is that? Okay. Anyway, no problem. No problem. That was Jonathan piping in, and um, I don't know what happened there. Okay, so I'm going to paste in a document here. So if you can take a look at this. So we can go over this as far as where we are on that. So if you click onto that document, automatic bed leveling, just basically some details of what to do. Now the first step is to to get, a, get your hands on a, the 3D printer part, which is the holder such that so i see one person came in so if you other guys can can go into the document 
in order to get the bed leveling working, there's a few steps. So first is is printing out that holder that which attaches the the sensor. And once you mount that, then you run the software to do it. But the first step I'd say would be this. Now, you do need to have the access to that. So I mean, what I can do is I can offer to send you send you guys this part. I just printed this out here. It takes 10 minutes to print. I can send this out. It's just basically a thing that looks like like a ring. And um, the CAD file is is there, as you see, as an STL file. But that's that's easy to print. So maybe I think probably the best thing if if you guys um, haven't gotten prints yet, I would say maybe I just send it out to you guys, and and um, maybe you could collect your addresses and send it out to you. It's an easy easy thing to to acquire. Uh, so with that part in place, there's a few steps of how you attach it. You have you basically have to take off the fan from the uh, the extruder just by removing those two screws that are on it so I'm on page four if you guys uh, so I see two people are in a document who who else is not wasn't able to get into the document um, well anyway um, I got dropped off and I couldn't um, I didn't hear how to get on oh, okay let me send that link again if you go into the chat box within um, Google Hangout, can you see that? It's the. Can you see the chat box? Yeah. Yeah, so you can just click into that. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And there's basic instructions there, but once once uh, we print out that holder, there's a removal of the fan. Um, it's just just a couple of steps, um, and then screwing screwing the thing, the holder, below the fan over the heat sink over the extruder block so it's it's pretty straightforward use the same screw as before and then uh, the mounted piece looks like number six so once you can get this that's step number one and that, then after that you download the software which is the automatic bed leveling software and then to do that what you want to do is um, I would I would say you download the um, the Arduino environment. Download the. I mean, you can the code that we have on the on the USB that we provided that does not have the automatic bed leveling. So you want to download Arduino environment, download the printer face, um, and then download this Marlin and upload the Marlin. So there's probably what's what's worth doing here is once you download it use arduino environment just like we were kind of work playing with in the workshop within our Vino, arduino environment uh, use a usb cable to upload to the controller but for, for that you have to have the arduino uh, Arduino environment so you got to do that if you if you Google Arduino uh, IDE uh, and I'll send the link to that Arduino IDE gets you to the Arduino so sorry Arduino IDE the software uh, you just download that for Mac PC or Linux so there's there's that page which is the Arduino environment so I'm on, I'm typing into into page um, page six in the document sorry page seven in the document and then download Pronterface so Pronterface you just google that that's the software we're actually using now we didn't have people download that just to avoid troubles but it seemed like we had a lot of issues with the with the uh, USB stick but Pronterface you can download download that readily um, print run called our Pronterface from here and basically the the thing would be if you have any troubles downloading any of these just contact me or we can go to the works I mean um, let's say support let's use the the forum the not the forum the, the OSC workshops Facebook group which is let me just link to that
uh, we can have discussions there just for support. I'm thinking that all the stuff that comes out of workshops, the relationships there, we can uh, continue discussion there. So this is the Open Source Ecology works, Workshops public group. Um, you can just sign up for that and and communicate there as well. Works, OC Workshops Facebook group, I'm putting it there. Putting the link. Okay. So that's, that's where you are. And then once you have the auto bed level Marlin, it basically runs straight off. You, you get it to... Well, essentially, once it, yeah, there's one little detail within the Arduino, within the Marlin, and we can get to that as you guys download it. You have to do settings in there, and let's see, if you click on that link for the, the Marlin, that's the file. Let's see, where's the documentation on the, on the settings? There's a couple of things to adjust in there. And let's see, I think that was, uh, let me see, Torbjorn sent us some information on that. Um, I'll, I'll paste that into this document as far as the specifics, but once you download the Marlin, you just simply have to put in an offset for the Z direction, like exactly how far you mounted it up off the bed compared to the nozzle. You just have to put in that number once you have the thing running and then then you'll get basically once you hit hit a print job you should be able to well first you got to test test that the height offset is good but with that you never ever have to worry about the the height leveling the height sensor well the the, the manual leveling with a piece of paper looking at all the corners you never have to worry about that again because the code adjusts that automatically for you with a sensor now the only other thing is you have your, uh, so I'm holding the, your metal print surface. You also have your sheet of build tack. Stick it on. This is a magnet, uh, a, a surface that the sensor will pick up. So you have to basically put that right on top of your heat bed. Use little clips, which look like the, alligator, the little alligator clips that you got, those little things. Use those to attach the bed, and that's the ready surface. Now this is nice and straight. That's that's the advantage of this. So with that, the prints, the print quality should become really good. And that's that's about all, all we can say for now as far as doing this. We gotta. Um, I need to send you the part, the printed part. Unless anyone has access to 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 anywhere else that you can print that little part, or if you want to print it on your own, I can gladly send that to you. So, um, and then you got to download the software and make it make it run. And I'll also put some more notes in the document as far as how exactly to do that. Um, okay, okay. Stacy keeps getting dropped there. Okay. Um, okay. So the next thing to to discuss is. Um, People looking at doing the workshops like Israel and Joshua and Jonathan. Um, for us at OSC, what what I'll be doing, and and that it basically means that if we're planning on the 14th, we've got about five or six weeks to do that. And there's a couple of things, a couple of things to to consider. So I'm gonna keep working in the same document. I'm gonna open up page seven. Um, so running a workshop so the key things to do um, for anyone who's considering that th this this would have to happen within the next two weeks I talked to Jenna I talked to also talked to Israel uh, regarding some further steps but um, can you fill me in guys or at least Israel have you have you taken any steps regarding any organizational organization work? Yeah, so the only thing I've done so far is uh, I actually uh, talked to someone about a space. Um, 
so that will be available on a you know donation basis. Mm -hmm. uh, besides that, uh, I've just been looking at your uh, spreadsheet, looking at the critical path. Uh, still not sure exactly what critical path is going to be because it's obviously going to be different, right? Yeah. We're going to have to maybe add some stuff, take some stuff away. I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah, let's take uh, a look at... Also, I noticed... Yeah, go, oh, ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I had a question about the audio-video requirements. Will, will there be any audio-video requirements for, for these, uh, I guess, splinter workshops? Uh, sorry, say that again? Uh, will there be any like specific auto audio visual requirements that you have? Because I noticed uh, there was one thing in the wiki that was about security venue, and it was it said there was some sort of audio, audio video video requirement. Yeah, Does that, that just basically have a, a monitor available. Right, that was with reference to people being able to see the instructions. Like we had the the overhead projector, the overhead screens this time around. I mean that's insofar as people can hear you, so that's that's really that. Um, it'll be, I mean, basically what we want to have people do is just take pictures of the event and you know just a little bit of documentation. Uh, biggest thing is to have the experience yeah. of actually can people run it and, and and that part. But basically what, um, so that's that's not a big deal. But the the two critical things that I do see happening is the written instructionals and the micro chunking micro chunking video instructionals. So we should talk about what what it's required to do that. Um, but before that, let me just uh, send you a link to the to the critical path. So when I when I say critical path, just some of the critical items that are before like when you organize the event. Uh, there's a thing called a critical path template. Um, I'm the wiki, I'm pulling it up. So it's just a sample document. So, so the link is like this. Uh, in it, you want to have critical cutoffs, like, like really secure venue. You gotta have an announcement. I mean, an instructor, I mean, like you, and a, an instructor and assistant. You have to secure that. You have to secure an announcement. Announcement um, plus some web presence, like even if it's a Facebook page or something. Um, and then also have the OSC branding, like basically if if you've got a design, you know, basically this, if you're running this workshop, we can help you publicize that, kind of certify that you're kind of running under our wings with that based on certain, certain requirements. Now, basically that you're, that you're open source and then you publish everything about this and use our model where you're uh, following this Prusa i3 build. Um, so we can help with just getting the word out there a little bit. Um, some of the critical, the, the biggest critical path item is that you have your, your bill of materials sourced, so part sourcing. And that, that thing, you have to start, start within four weeks and, and within contact, so contact the supplier, which is Folger Tech, four weeks ahead of time, and then like make sure you're sending out every single order by like two weeks ahead of time if you have to basically have them ship like two weeks ahead of time but as long as they know that they have already prepared your order for you so you got to check in with them ahead if depending on how many printers you're getting because if you if you flood them with printers like 12 24 printers they might they're a small company so they might have trouble trouble delivering if you don't give them a heads up um Time for shipping. Um, so that's basic milestones, but it'll, it'll be good to keep track of that. Uh, why I suggested the critical path template, uh, sample critical path diagram. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, uh, 
Yeah, and there's some... Yeah, this critical path diagram is just basically timelines, a flow with a date on the x-axis, and the different steps you have to get there to run a workshop, just, just so you kind of keep it clear in your mind. The other thing is, if you're doing this and collaborating on this, um, keep a lot work log so that we can help you out. Um, so work log is, there's a page called work log, there's a little, little instructional video for how we do that basically. What do you do to, what do you do and why it's important. It's basically to help everybody collaborate on a project. But start a work log, like you can see my, so creating a work log video here. But like March and log, you can see, you can pretty much follow all the stuff I'm doing and it helps people collaborate. So start a log. Um, so start a work log. Those are some of the main main things. Work log. I'll show you an example. Well, a link to the other page, which has the instructional. Okay. Um, so, so the main two needs are the, the little video instructionals like we learned from last time that to loop, loop back and forth a, a repetitively a video like just with a small step and probably working things to basically that the whole group is on the same page and as soon as anybody is done, everybody helps them. I think we should return to that more, try to make it happen. So, uh, but with that said, that plus the written instructionals, just some more detailed instructions, probably some Google Docs on how to... Uh, how to build the thing so people can both read the read the step by step and also see the video because different people work differently So with that with that said, what do you guys think? So can you? Um, are you guys seeing my screen? Yeah, I guess you uh -oh. May not be seeing my screen here Yeah, no, I'm not, I don't see it. Okay. Are you seeing it now? Uh, I see you Okay, to present to everyone. Now we got it. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, but you can see in a in a working document, there's the links that the critical path, the work log. Now, okay, so so we need to talk about the micro chunking video instructionals and the written instructionals. So so if we can do some division of labor and who can who can help do that. Um, and first of all, before we do that. Uh, jo Jonathan, are you okay on, um, does May 14 still sound good to you? Just checking in on, on a timeline. Jonathan, we can't hear you. Okay. Okay, um, but primarily from Israel, maybe Joshua, since you've, you've done the initial videos, um, who can volunteer to do the microchunking breakdown? Joshua, you, would you have any time to do that? Basically yes, how... Yes, I can commit to you finishing okay. out all the videos. I'm going to microchunk them all down and finish them out all the way to the very end as well. That would be great. That would be excellent. Um, Israel, would you have some time to maybe work on the written instructions, pictures, and which we can adapt from the manual and from some of our pictures that we have? Um, yeah, I do. Um, how, is, is that just going to be, I mean, I guess that's a concurrent, you know, step, right? Yeah. I, I just have to, what, look at the uh, current stuff we have or whatever? Yeah. I mean, there's the build manual that's on, uh, so basically let's let's post that there on the in a document so so Joshua's committing to the micro chunk Israel do you do any photography no no I don't do, do you have a camera um I might have access to one yeah okay yeah I mean as simple as uh, as your cell phone if you, you got a cell phone camera that works well too 
Um, but for the written instructionals, the base document from Folger Tech already has a lot of different pictures, but they're not really in the kind of order that we did. As base steps. And that document is so it's on the Prusa i3 build page. So if you go there, uh, page on the wiki, Prusa i3 build, there's the build instructions instructions from Folger Tech. I think this this page here is good just so you can access all the work and the pictures we had um, provided. So, so you can look at this page. I'll just put a link to that. And then also the one we were using yesterday, the build optimization, the, the modular build, modular build instructions. That was the Prusa i3 build optimization. Also, uh, where do we want those folks? You said you want those on a Google Doc? Yeah, so if we do a Google, Google Slides and then just add them to your log. So use Google Slides. which is embeddable so you can just embed it and then and then post on wiki uh, what we can do so so let me just show you this then and then post in the development spreadsheet the, the overall page where we have all the documents uh, so let me just show you that piece right there so if we go to well page called d3d which is the distributive 3d printer uh, D3D page, there's a development spreadsheet where all the stuff that we've done so far is linked to, like the videos, the build instructions, etc. So we can add, like you see here, there's um, the build, there's build instructions on this link right here in line 20. Uh, we can add those instructions. So here we've got the modular build right now, that's what it links to, but underneath that, um, yeah, we'll just add add the instructions to to the main development spreadsheet here. We can uh, so we can find everything here. Like the videos would go under um, build video. That's line number twenty six and so forth. So we can then link the new instructions to this main development spreadsheet, so we know where to find everything. This this is basically where everything around the project is found. So that's where it's at. Um, yeah, yeah. So those are the two main needs. Uh, as far as timelines for that, if we've got, um, um, so Israel, so you've got a, a venue that's that's secured that that is donated and that's that's affirmed already. Well, yeah, they only uh, requested a donation. Uh, okay. From 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 me. Okay. So, so you're okay on that? And and how many people can that space fit? And what, sorry, what, what was the place? Did you mention what that was? Did you say a hackerspace? Yeah, it was a yeah, it was the sort of hackerspace. And how how or much space, space? How much space is there? How much what? How much space is there to for, for how many uh, 3D printed uh, boards? I asked. I asked them for uh, if they could fit eight to fifteen people. Uh huh. Did that sound about right? I mean. Yeah. Yeah. And I've been there before too. Uh, it would definitely fit about that many people, I think. Eight to fifteen. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's good. I mean, I think um, for a successful event, I mean as. If as few as six people sign up, that's you know, that's that's good good enough. So what about details like the cost structure and um, cost structure for one, and the announcement payment handling? So 
just just for reference of others um, so other details so what are you thinking of charging people for this workshop yeah that's what uh, I'm not really sure like uh, it, it's got to be at least the price of the kit right so yeah anything more than that yep but is there like a certain percentage that I don't know is, it, is there a standard percentage yeah, I mean, what we've done is, so um, right, it's, it's anything, it's basically, if you're going to run that, it would be basically what, what covers your time for doing that, um, so, so you can make a decision based on that, but I mean, um, yeah, yeah, that's a decision, I mean, we've done basically the $600 thing, which was about 300 above the, the, the price to to make this self-sustaining um, I would say anywhere between like 150 to 300 bucks for the per seat and probably do uh, like we did the two for one where you bring a person for free with you which is a good thing uh, so that's that would be the suggestion uh, I would say um, say as a general drone thing 150 to 300 dollars above material cost to, to make sure all the costs are covered um, and then you have to consider like if you're gonna eat lunch or whatever and as far as the timing what are you, what are your thoughts on the time like 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. maybe something like that would be a good standard to do yeah and that, that's that's what I told them for the space was 8 to 8 just, uh -huh. just following what you guys were doing too yeah uh, Obviously, we went over, but <laughs> I'm right. hoping that, you know, with right. a few more refinements, it won't be that long, right? Right, right. And what what is our conclusion on the the number one or a no, couple of biggest keys to make it, it go a little better? I think, um, what's our conclusion on that? One, definitely people called out for the instructionals that people can... Um, can be b better informed, but I think if people if if it's done in unison, and people actually help others, I think, I think that will save a bit of time there. And of course, the number yeah, one, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say, um, like I, I don't know if this was done or not before, but uh, to, to like know explicitly what steps can be done concurrently. Like, that might be a big help, too, just so people know, you know, ahead of time that, oh, these two things can be done at the same time. Not sure if there is some, just some explicit way of doing that, maybe putting things in, like, a table or something. Right, right. And that, you know, the learning it appeared to be that it was imp kind of impossible to get people to work in parallel. I mean, you mean the if there's two people on a team? Right. I don't know. I mean, it, it depends what kind of crowd you get, but at least the learning from this time around was that everybody, uh, it wasn't that two people were working in parallel. It was that everybody just helped each other. And the only way that we can address that potentially is if there is a, like basically every person gets instructionals that are parallel like okay you you do this and the other person does that and you have like literally two instructions for each module but we know that right. I mean, we were trying to trying to make that happen that people would do that i think it's possible we should try that like when you do the instructions the written instructions um and with the micro chunking instructions I think that that could work together because okay, micro chunk it. There's one step. Say you know, take the frame, the bottom frame, top frame. Um, we can say okay, explicitly one person do that and the other person work on the other one. There's two separate instructionals, two sep, two separate videos. I think that could work, but at least we know that in the last event that didn't happen, and that's that's a piece of learning. Um, so I think we can't. I mean. In theory, you can say that, oh, okay, you can almost double the time if people can work absolutely in parallel. 
uh, but at the minimum you could you know get like 30 percent or so of time reduction or something which would be a couple of hours or so so i think i think it's definitely worth a try and to shoot for that kind of learning like okay did people actually start working in parallel or was it so unknown to people that people just kind of helped each other in their individual team um how about um stacy what do you think about that maybe get your feedback on that can you hear me yeah yep go ahead stacy We can hear can you, you now. Yourself? Yeah. Sounds like you're on right now. Sounds like you're on right now. We can hear you. Okay. Um, I kind of struggled in the workshop, so I don't think I'm a good person to ask. I'm not super mechanical or technical. In order for me to do a workshop, I feel like I would have to build another printer um, over again and work out the kinks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and right. So, uh, yep. uh, the thing is that you're actually a good person to ask that okay. because, uh, especially for people who are not technically savvy, um, do you? What would it take to like, for example, in in your case example, what would it take for two people actually to so work what, in? Uh, Right. You know, just on my own, build another one. Yeah. Right. It's the familiarity part. Um, because I did get a lot of assistance during the build. Right. And I think now that I've gone through it, it would definitely be easier. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so some people just won't be... Yeah, I mean, some people just won't do it. It won't um, have the confidence. I the videos were really, really important. For mm -hmm. me. Yeah. I think, you know, I think for the next one, Israel, I think if we do the videos properly and have the text instructions, I mean, we can simply try to do better. I mean, that's that's all we can do. I think it's definitely worth, worth trying and keeping that as a possibility that we can, uh, as a general rule, have, have two people work in parallel. What about the videos? Just the, the visual part of it, or the, the sound, the audio instructions? Uh, you're asking what's... Sorry, I'm missing the question. Israel, can, can you... Uh, you're muted. Can you repeat it? You went on mute. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Israel. Can you can you repeat? Um, Israel, repeat your question, which you asked, asked about the video instructionals. Oh yeah, I was just wondering uh, what about the video was it? Was it the did did it help more to, to see it visually, or did it help more to, to hear it? I think for me it was visual, seeing it. Yeah. Yeah, and that could be well, a Another mm -hmm. question is, is if there were like texts, uh, it's text instructions along with the visual and the video and the audio, would that add to it or would it be more distracting maybe? I mean, for me, I just learned better with visual instructions. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think it depends on who the person is. I, I think that some will gravitate towards the visual some people might use both, but in any case, we, we need to have both available because we don't know who's going to be at the workshop, and it's the more resources we have, the better. 
Um, I don't know if there's a way to really useful thing is if everybody's looking at a computer screen or like or a tablet of some sort maybe we can focus on on having people bring bring their computer uh, and possibly do something like um, I mean a PDF that's prepared before that people have access to like a, you know a week before the workshop they have a complete PDF of all the steps and and we have them review the videos uh, before the workshop I think that that might help but definitely having people um, um, emphasize the need for just bringing a computer that you can w look look at it I think that's that probably could be a good help thoughts on that yeah I think that's really important too because I think that's you, also, yeah. you also need uh, the, the software so people need to have their own computer to, to implement the software as well Right. Yeah, so I think we can met we can um call out for that. Um so maybe write a note more notes. I'm on page nine of the document, copying some notes. But definitely emphasize a computer for having your own notes um, it might be what about people bringing also just like an earphone set because I mean if everybody's playing their computer with the sound can would that get kind of like messy too noisy or I was just just thinking about that, but maybe maybe say bring bring headphones. And then there's uh, yeah so. Yeah. Taking some notes. Headset is always preferable. Pre workshop video. Mm. That's a that's a good one indeed. I was uh just thinking about uh, another thing too is uh would it be too much to try to send participants like uh, ahead of time, uh, overviews maybe. Yeah. So they can look at it at, at on their own time, like before even coming to the workshop. Of the build, just details right. about the build. Yeah, I mean it. It could definitely work. The thing is, like, why I didn't really emphasize it this time is I know that a lot of people don't don't really look at that kind of stuff before the workshop because they're pretty busy. But. Um, I think that no that's definitely worthwhile I mean some people will do that some people at least will will review that and, and be ahead of the game and I kind of possibly even call out for um, um, even like challenge people in announcements saying hey we need some people to step up to kind of like help others like the people who are better who feel that more confidence in their mechanical skills um, you can kind of like maybe work with them a little more up front and say hey um, make sure you go over maybe go over the procedures with them or something like that yeah so basically pick out leaders i think that that's a good idea um martian are you, are you talking about having actual other uh, uh workshop attendees be the leaders or are you yeah I mean people who are in a better position to help out during the event like if you see that somebody somebody really jumps up and says hey I you know I feel pretty good about helping out do you need some help you know just just kind of cultivate the people that are kind of like leadership development cultivate those people that are that appear likely to help out or who feel confident who have some leadership skill so just try to identify those people 
uh, before the workshops, you know, just contact everybody who signs up, have them pretty much talk to them and say, hey, uh, send them a survey. I would say, um, so pre, we didn't do this this time. I mean, pre-workshop survey, I think like, okay, what are your skills? Can you help out during the event? That would be a useful thing to do. Um, let's see who you think uh, you'd have time to to devise a survey like that, Israel, for your your own. Or we should try to sh have a have a collaboratively developed survey. That's a more of a template. Uh, we should probably put it on the yeah, plate. Yeah, it's not a bad idea. Yeah, yeah, we should we should do that. Let's do. Okay, I think we should do that. Would you be using a, a Google for that too, like a Google server? I'd say a Google form would be good for that. Mm -hmm. And um, if we have the development spreadsheet, so there's um, on a development spreadsheet, see you guys if you keep looking at my screen there. So on a spreadsheet itself, there's a second tab called event organization. And it actually has a lot of different assets for event organization. Um, but just various notes that we picked up along the road you can review a bunch of that but um, so there's things like event announcement but let's see do we have a placeholder for workshop survey see that's more like a like a survey after the event that we've done but we should also have a pre pre workshop survey so that should be a definite placeholder should definitely have a placeholder for that so I'm gonna add that to the development spreadsheet so under event organization I'm gonna put in um, line number so it was under continuous quality improvement number 25 so let's insert a row above that to say workshop pre-survey um, yeah I should definitely definitely add that Reprint a workshop pre survey. Okay. Um, so now it's a blank page on the wiki, but we can should start a Google Doc on that. Start a Google uh, Google form. So basically, the things um, things to look at look for questions such as. Um, assess someone can rise to leadership to some form of leadership in a I mean maybe maybe like propose a couple of tasks to get people involved like um, for example review the build instructions and see if they appear clear to you you know things like that such as reviewing videos or build instructions so we can basically have the people in a workshop get, start getting involved and actually adding to the quality of the the materials uh, so various things like um, other crowdsource tasks or doing other things like if people have other skills um, there's a I'm gonna point you to on my log I actually put a there's a lot of different ways that people who are not computer programmers or tech savvy can help out on projects. Uh, I just saw um, non how non programmers can contribute to open source projects. There was a good article on opensource.com, so I'm gonna link to that. But there's a bunch of stuff people can help out here. They say. Use the product, bug test, write documentation, translation, evangelize, donate, be professional. Uh, there's some, some hints there. Um, use the product. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's a decent, decent article. But it, it's worth... Um, it's worth requesting people to do other things like for example infographic like if we want to get a you know have somebody do an infographic on a 3d printer various things it depends when when the person signs up and stuff like that 
Um, but definitely pre-survey would be a good idea. What else to cover? So as far as the registration part, uh, what we do recommend is Eventbrite because that's a that's a good good platform. It it works. And uh, so that would be on a. As far as the roadmap, critical path, set up Eventbrite. I mean, announcement. Then, for the announcement, you have to have an Eventbrite set up, or some other, um, some other registration thing. Yeah, yeah. What are some um, so? Any other questions or any any issues that? Yeah, I was uh, I was gonna say it might be important to differentiate between a co-facilitator and you know, that would be helping because you might you might get a lot of volunteers that are gonna send up the workshop that really think they can do it, but they won't be as helpful as like say Jonathan or Joshua were in our workshop, you know, because you you came with like a team. And uh, I think that I think that's really what made it possible for us to leave our country. Yeah. So differentiate between facilitators and who? And other students who would be helping out because if, if you just showed up like what you did, you were counting on the student to help the, each other out. I don't know if that would work. No. Out. But because you had the um, co-facilitators, those those guys really were able to get their hands on everybody's machines. You know. Right. Right, and um, th th what it requires is that the, pe the people who are the co-facilitators actually have done the build. So the only suggestion I would have for you is that if you do have a, a, a person that you'd train to help you, you definitely want to go through a build, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Just just like so they could be as savvy as Joshua or, or Jonathan were at, at the workshop in Kansas City. Right. Where they, they could really sit down with each student and walk through them. Yeah, I mean, if you can put uh, onerous on, on another student and they could possibly volunteer to have you and they can really contribute. Yeah, that's something we can actually, uh, you know, as soon as the first person signs up, I mean, as soon as we have the announcement, we can, like, since you're in Seattle and some people will probably sign up from your near area, you can perhaps say, hey, we're looking for people to help co facilitate it. If you want to do it, we're having a pre build, you know, practice build. Do something like that, yeah. So that you're cultivating some people. Yeah. yeah. Do you think you'd do something like that? Uh, yeah, I've, I've been talking with this girl, and, and I think it would definitely be beneficial to have one main facilitator and then several co-facilitators. And then if we have if we have overachieving students, then all the better. Yeah. Yeah, one main facilitator, and I think the the kind of thing you want to shoot for is, uh, yeah, like if you gotta have two two good facilitators for twelve people. I mean, that would be a minimum, I would say, until the point where then like we learn from the instruction, like the, until the instructionals get really good, and the process really starts to flow, because people, like one, we prepare people beforehand, which means okay that's more than we have done like we haven't really prepared the workshop participants well the last time so if we work more on preparing people beforehand and then upgrade the video and written instructionals that could help a lot I mean I, I definitely see a potential where it's it's almost like it can the, the instructions are so good that the facilitators only facilitate not like <laughs> at the minimum level possible because that's that's the way it's not gonna tax the people who are running the workshop because it's a hard thing to pull off another thing is uh, as far as the prep time, once you get the kits in your hands, there's a bunch of, um, yeah, we should actually talk about the part of organizing things in, like, Ziploc bags, because we, we basically separate parts, and then people, like, put them together again when the workshop happened. That should be integrated. So, so one, one more thing, I'm going to duplicate the slide here. Um, 
I think that's a big learning. Just do a better job on how you prepare the the materials. Um, material prep. Yeah, and that also involves having a bunch of uh, spare parts. Because remember how many like uh, how many Arduinos we went through and how yeah. many power sources that burned out. Mm -hmm. You guys had that whole van full of full of extra stuff in case things went down. Yep. So, so that was yeah, that was a pretty key thing I think that happened too. And that's actually a that's a that's a that don't ask, underestimate how much time that takes. We spent like uh, probably three days. Uh, preparing the materials so yeah you got you just got to put the time into that um, the biggest thing was like separating out all the bolts like organizing all those those were like took out the most time what I would suggest actually one learning here is um, the kits were rather reliable so if you have all the all the bolts it's not necessarily critical that you separate them for people they can actually pick them out but you know you, you kind of have to think about it I'm, I'm not clear about that you if people don't have the bolts separated out I don't know what the result would be for how much time it takes them to sort through the bolts it yeah that might be might be challenging I think you got to separate the bolts by the module I think you got to give it to the people because because if you you know start screwing something and it's the wrong screw you got to redo it and I think that could could end up wasting a lot of time. So maybe maybe separate the bolts too, definitely into the modules when you when you do that. Yeah, uh, I definitely I agree with that. Yeah. Okay. So no messing around with that part. Um, yeah, you want to eliminate anything that might catch people up and or have to go back and and, and uh, you know lose time with. Right. Yep. Anything else? What else? What what other issues to cover? It seems like there's a lot of different places to go to get information. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm just looking at all the different things you're doing on this screen, and um, I don't know how to get to some of those pages or find those places. So I think um, some kind of really good outline with the links on it that are explained. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're talking about getting more to the... Someone just needs to step in and do that, cause, cause there's um. <laughs> maybe you can give me some feedback. So there's this page right here, if you, so D3D, if you have access to this spreadsheet, does that make any sense? Cause actually it's like all the links are in in the spreadsheet, like every yes. single thing. Yeah. Yes, I like the spreadsheet, but I don't know how to find it. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, the Uber. <laughs> important place is called uh, D3D that's the page on the wiki I can type that in uh, and what we're doing too is we're we're doing a, an info box which is a something like an easier to parse summary of this kind of a spreadsheet so we're gonna create info boxes for all our stuff on the wiki so it's a little easier to navigate but yeah that's um, that's the link there and pretty much uh, do that. Yeah. Um. Right. Brian, do you have any other other comments uh, regarding regarding anything? Yeah. Um, so you guys aren't um, aren't thinking about a workshop in the future, or or possibly? Uh, no, we, we're definitely thinking about a workshop in the future. I, I want to make sure that I have uh, enough facilitators that were, that would actually uh, be able to get it down. 
So I, I've been talking with Israel. I think I think he dropped out of the hangout for some reason. But uh, I've been I've been talking to him. I don't know about the the makerspace that he's talking about, but um, ah. I just I just want to make sure that uh, that there's enough uh, able-bodied mm. uh, facilitators to, to actually uh, push the people through because yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't want to get people coming and then not know, not know how to finish it on their own. That's right. So are you thinking of um, working with, are you guys going to collaborate on the event on, on May 14? Uh, absolutely. Okay, I'm sorry, I missed that. I totally missed that. Okay. Um, I, 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 I've been talking with him, and, and my mother-in-law is actually an old uh, corporate trainer. She retired, and uh, she's, she's been looking at the... Um, And then uh, we're gonna. I'm, I don't feel confident that I'm able to do it yet. Um, and uh, and I don't know. I don't know for me if any level of uh, instructions would really help it. But what did help it was the co-facilitators and you, quite frankly, were able to be on, be, put your hands on the machine and, and troubleshoot it as as we went on. Right. So. So once once I feel confident enough that there'll there be enough uh, able-bodied facilitators, uh -huh. that 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 once I feel confident about that, then I can start getting a feel for how many people would actually want to take the workshop. Okay. Yeah. So you looking at the one uh, one with Israel as further practice until you get? Well, I'm I'm just working with Israel because we're we're both regional. Mm-hmm. So, yep. so um, yeah, I'm just helping him out, and uh, and then he's going to come down and, and look at the camp and see about, about our place as a venue as well. Okay. How far are you from, um, like, downtown Seattle? I'd put it about an hour and 25 minutes with no traffic. Mm-hmm. And then we're about an hour and 15 minutes north of the port. So we're, we're smack dab in the middle of, of both cities. Hour 15 from Portland? Brian, you mentioned hour hour fifteen north of um, north of Portland. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. So that's. Yeah, you got opportunities there. Sounds good. Um. So the. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um. Let's see, who's Hermit Barber there? Who is that? Uh. Mr. Hermit, can you identify yourself? Carl, okay. Ah, <laughs> okay. Okay, okay. Good, I guess you guys are silent in the back. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, cool, glad to have you. Oh, there he, he unmuted. Hermit, are you there? Maybe. Maybe his bike's not. Okay. Um, so anyway, uh, one of the last things I just wanted to go over is, uh, so so product evolution, uh, if you, my log is where I always go back to, to find stuff. Uh, product evolution, I've been doing this, but for the workshop in Kansas City, this area here, so this is the design evolution document, but the simple thing that we're going to do for next time is we're going to take the guts of the Prusa, i3 that we did and here's kind of like the the design iteration if you guys can see my screen there yeah i think you guys can see it it's on a 3d printer roadmap um you can click onto that but basically the the design evolution here is add an enclosure for the second time and why that's because there's an interesting feature of that. If we add the enclosure and make it super easy to build just four, basically four sheets of metal that are CNC cut with all the holes to attach everything else, they can in principle save, I mean, it took us two hours to do the frame in, the first, in our event. This could be as simple as snap together corners, like on the top and bottom snap together at each corner, and that's it. You got four sheets of metal, five minutes. Five minutes is less than two hours, so I like that. <laughs> but the idea is then it also evolves to the 
to the enclosure which gets you the heat retention so lower energy use and higher quality prints so that's as far as we want to get for the next time so that's that's what I'm working on here so that means I've got 10 days to come up with those files and do all of that but but the cool thing is if you go into that document yeah, it's like talking about scalability um, why station why enclosure less time to heat up higher quality prints less warping contains fumes um, disadvantages it's more materials well it's not really more materials because you're eliminating the tubing so it's not necessarily more materials it is somewhat less access to parts well that's what you get with an enclosure now if we do the enclosure the, the, these are the six items we have to consider that we need to connect we need to connect the two Z motors to the frame that means we can simply mount them to the side pieces of the frame the rod holders on the Z they need to be mounted to the frame four Y rod holders so the, basically the bed they are mounted to the frame the power supply is mounted to the frame the Y belt holder once again mounted to the outside frame and the Y motor that means I need to poke holes in that frame the metal frame for all those and then eliminate all the pieces all the the extrusion tubings and all those tiny bolts that were associated with that beforehand so that that could mean a, a major major simplification and here I just kind of went through the interface design um, so basically uh, in this interface design here the panels receive those holes as mentioned as, as shown here so basically if I can CAD this out and CNC cut this then we can accommodate the attachment of all the guts the entire 3d printer um, by these um, basically two panels to it so that's two two unique part count one panel has uh, five holes one panel has four holes period that's it power supply Z motors rod holder um, Y rod holders and belt holder that's it so to draw a frame in FreeCAD that's the next lesson of starting with FreeCAD uh, drawing the parts in there blah 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 we need to tra train people like what I'd like to see the 3d printer workshop evolve into is that people actually learn um, as a construction set so all the parts are in FreeCAD with an easily manipulable manipulable 3d CAD software so that's gonna um, in the future maybe have a day uh, teaching people about FreeCAD and design design of an actual 3d printer and possibly where you if you design it we have parts on hand that you can make different iteration different versions like larger or smaller frames different lengths etc so you can pretty much design your own 3d printer and then build it that's kind of the the next the next steps but for next time on uh, May fit May uh, May 14 that is start with the enclosure uh, so that's the cunning plan as far as we're concerned for the the branch here and that's about all I have in store to so to wrap up it sounds um, like that go ahead it sounds like that it enclosed to streamline a bunch of the a bunch of the steps wouldn't it it certainly does um, I think there's yeah, going to be a huge time savings with the enclosure. Now there's a lot of a lot of little details to work out because pretty much I think we have to the one one way to do it would be to 3D print all the little mounting pieces. So you've got the the metal frame and 3D printed simple mount pieces and connectors. So that means you're you're increasing a bunch of time for 3D printing, but that could be done beforehand. But it's also something you can do with the printer itself, of course. So it it could really work out. A uh, little bit of development on that, but um, I think worth it. Mm -hmm. So that will be the next iteration. Um, that sounds great, man, because because I think that would be that would really cut out a lot of the problems that the non-mechanical people would have, and it would just be be more of like putting something together mm -hmm. rather than something. So like then like the, the final step would be the the last panel on the front, and then you just click and then tell it to print something, you know? Yeah. I think that yeah. would be really cool. Yeah, I think so. Um, definite potential there. The advantage being that you can make those 3D printed connectors, just really size them for much bigger bolts. I mean, it's, those tiny little bolts are so painful to work with. And a slightly larger bolt, like I'm thinking 
inch, like three eighths or even one half inch, just totally overkill it because it doesn't really add much to the cost. Or I don't think it will add any to the cost. Those bolts are relatively inexpensive. So, yeah. Um, but to sum up, so so uh, in this um, in the document that we pasted, follow the instructions to add the um, the bed leveling. Email me marchin at opensourceecology.org if you wanna uh, want me to send you the part, which is this key-like looking part to mount the mount the sensor. You already have the connector for the sensor. That's all. You just gotta plug it into. Uh, I'll add those docu the documentation here, but you mount that um, as in these instructions and download the code. And I also have to send you some more instructions on how to do this code. But the step number one is to do the little build upgrade. Go from there and uh, email me to get that. And I'd say let's let's have another call next week, Monday at 6 p.m. as well, to go over the remaining, uh, actually the install of the sensor and also pursue further the, the workshop. And see how far I am on the on the workshop for doing an enclosure. I should have the files for that by that time as well. Um, so I'd like to sum up with that. Uh, any other last last words of wisdom from anybody? Or pending no no further comments. Thank you all for listening. Email me for the file, uh, the actual 3D print, send me your address, and we'll go from there, and we'll talk to you all next week. Does that sound good? Sounds great. I'm stopping the sharing here. Okay, see you guys next week then. Take care then. smaller than a machine which is a module such as a universal rotor or you can have even smaller modules or parts like here's the bolt or you know bolt and